Hey, established factors. This is Dr. Deb, and I am in the board game room, exhibit hall E at Gen Con, one of my favorite places to go at Gen Con. So y'all heard on episode one, right, when I was talking about the war game? Well, I am surrounded by the war game tournament right now, and we have the inventor of this crazy awesome game beside us, Mr. Jeff Stein. So I'm going to ask him some questions and let him talk to you about his invention. So the first thing I want to ask, give me like the two or three minute blip. Tell me what the war game is for the people who did not hear episode one. Well, it is the it is the biggest supreme king granddaddy of all board games. It is the Guinness World Record holder for the world's largest board game at 39 inches by 77. Size matters. And, um, you know, like a lot of gamers, uh, I started out being an Axis and Allies obsessive. Uh, wanted something bigger, wanted something bigger. Tried everything out there and then said, I guess I'm going to have to make my own. There was a hand-painted version. There was a second hand-painted version. And then, uh, then I did one on Adobe Illustrator, and, and the diehards will appreciate this. I drew it, every seashore line with a mouse, like a monk recopying the Bible, you know, <laughs> just doing the entire thing. And then, uh, and then had the, the video of Adobe Illustrator, though, you can expand it, you can change it. So as we went along, we said, you know, we got to blow up Europe, we got to stretch Asia, you know, make it, because that's where all the action is. And, uh, and then it kept developing, and then eventually uh, Pegasus Hobbies came along, and it was the perfect, you know, symbiosis where he, uh, the owner of that, always wanted to have a World War II board game. He just always dreamed it, because they did RC miniatures and uh, RC car stuff, RC miniatures and all these different, um, you know, models, and he wanted a, you know, World War II game. So he kind of observed and go to cons, and we were setting up. We were doing Gen Con since Milwaukee with the hand painted board that long ago, and, um, and he's watching. He's asking around, you know, what's this game like, and 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 the reason this game exists to a large degree. It, again, it, people always say thank the fans, but it's the fans because that's the testimony. People would just come up and say, you know, they would tell him, "It's the best game I've ever seen in my entire life," you know. And it was like, and and you can imagine the honor, you know, of that because like anything, you want to make a game and then you want people to enjoy it. But uh, and then um, and then years of balancing the math is probably one of the most play tested games ever, uh, which is a big deal. You know, the fans will tell you if you ask that it's. Uh, it is pretty damn balanced, and uh, and it's very. Uh, there's always a counter move. It's that uh, we like to call it um, the most improvisational of all the A and A genre games because you can't really play the board. You got to play the player. You know, you can't just get away with some pat move or some pat angle. Uh, you gotta, you know, you gotta outwit, outsmart, outlast, and um, and uh, yeah. So it's been an amazing journey. You know, we. Uh, it's like anything. You you, you dream of. You know, first creating a game that people like, and then you get these kind of milestones that show you, you know, what you achieve. You know, the first time you show up at a con or something, and you see people, you start to set up the board, and people walk up and they've totally memorized the setup. You know, so they're just going, duh, 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 duh. and for those who know this game, that's like an amazing, you know, feat to know the setup because there's, you know, we have 511 pieces, and then a good, you know, 200 of them are in the opening setup or something. I don't know. So. Um, yeah, and you're just like, oh wow, these people know their things. And then, and then the other dream you have is uh, because you know, like a lot of people, I was really good at Axis and Allies, and and if you're really good, sometimes it's hard to find anybody who wants to play you, you know, because they, you be, you beat them all the time. And uh, and so one of my other dreams was to be challenged, you know. And so the more this was out there, um, and again, we started out where I was just selling boards and rules. I would sell a board for three hundred dollars because that's how much it cost to print, you know, a giant four by eight sheet. And then uh, it's down to like 220 now, but it's still pretty expensive. And um, and people would buy those. And so there was play testing going on around the country, which kept it uh, avoided the group think, which was a really big factor. If I can give advice to anyone making a game, get play testers away from you that you know create their own world because they'll come back and you'll go, oh wow, I never even thought of that move, you know. Anyway, back to my point, which I will ramble. I'm a talker. <laughs> See, I hadn't noticed. And. Uh, <laughs> And um, so you you have this dream that people will, will come and beat you. And there's guys like uh, this guy here. Oh, yeah. Come here. Yeah. This guy here. This is Alex Rothstein. Legend. Don't embarrass him. No relation. Yeah. Um, go away. No. Legend. And he's, a, and he's a legend. He and his partner, John, and they have this. Not only are they are they brilliant, and then I was telling him earlier, it's fun to, to have oh, someone yeah, come you. and, uh, you know, these new players who are just playing your game, they weren't part of the design, they weren't part of the original play test, and to go to come up with these strategies where, you know, we go home going, we must beat Alex. <laughs> we must, you know. And, and that's uh, it's pretty rewarding and so yeah and now we're finally at the point where we have tournaments he's the master he won last year 
And oh, um, yeah, and the year before, basically, it was like Tom Terman kind of crumbled, but he still won. <laughs> and uh, the uh, yeah, so and it's eight players and eight teams, and and, and we're doing cash prizes now and, and swag. We got a corporate sponsor. Somebody's giving us uh, you know uh, uh, pieces and miniatures and things for the winners. So uh, nice. we're big time. The strippers come at three o'clock, <laughs> and uh, we have uh, we have ring girls. Exactly, that's right. We have our own football team. You know, but um, yeah, it's a really good time. So there. It is. Yes. There you go. That. See the uh, their endorsements yeah. from an expert at the game. Yeah, seriously. Okay. Well, we also have one of our other podcasters who you all are familiar with. I'm going to hand him the mic. I'm going to let him introduce himself, and I'm going to let him ask Jeff a question. So, all right. This is Anton from the Established Facts, and my question to you is: How much of your inspiration is from other players and such of rules and changes to the game? Well, for that, I have to bring in my friend. <laughs> this is John Liddy. Um, this guy here uh, really is the biggest part of why this, another reason why, you know, Pegasus, Larry from Pegasus, you know, obviously he had the means to make the game, but this is why the game is, he's one of the reasons why the game is awesome. You know, because uh, it started out, he was just being selfish. Um, we, uh, he liked going to Gen Con all the time, but he, he was having trouble finding people to go. And I had this game, and he's like, you have to go to Gen Con. You have to go and demo that at Gen Con. And I'm like, okay, all right, I guess. I've never been. And he goes, and we drag it out there. And, 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 and the response was instant, you know, because his enthusiasm is, is, is excessive. And then he, he's been there with the whole playtesting process, which is, which is massive. You know, you can't do anything alone. No man is an island. And uh, he's my driving force, my best friend who has just, you know, dragged me all over. And he's even gone to other conventions like Heat of Battle in New Orleans and things like that. And so, and uh, yeah, so John's been a, a major part of it. Plus, plus, he's a really good player. So, and we have a good yin yang. And gamers will appreciate the, yes. uh, the idea. I'm more of the mathematic calculated type. And he's the, I'm going to roll this. And I'm going to totally do this. So, you know, we're going to go in. I'm like, hey. Dice of chance roll. Yeah, he's failing it. And so, you know, we're both tactical, but he also has the uh, added, he has the balls. Let's, uh, let's say, call it what it is. Yeah, Jeff's been an inspiration. Uh, I can't say enough. Uh, if it wasn't for him introducing the game to me and giving me the opportunity to work with him over 12 years. Yeah, it's been like 12, 15 yeah, years Yeah, it's, uh, it's been quite a journey, yeah. and we have had nothing but fun. Yeah, and we it's met, really been uh, awesome. he... Uh, he put in an ad at the local game shop for Axis and Allies players, and the other guys he was playing with were a little weirded out. They're like, who's this random guy showing up today that oh, yeah. we found off a flyer, you know? <laughs> yeah, we met in a very random moment. That, that yeah. was awesome. That yeah, was and, awesome. and I showed up, and we played Axis and Allies. And for, it took me a while, because at first I said, I've got this other game. And they're like, no, no, we don't want to play your other game. No, we won't play Axis and Allies. And I kept beating him down, and eventually I, I got to talk him into playing, and then John was like, we need to play this, you know? Yeah. And then it just went from there and grew, and then and, and here it is, yeah. The best way I've ever described it is Axis and Allies on steroids. That is uh, where, yeah, somebody <laughs> else coined that, but we've been stealing it ever since. Yes. Because uh, that is about right, it is. And, uh, and like I said, it's a little more balanced, a little more improvisational, which we like about it. Um, you know, a lot of games, I, I have a great sympathy for game makers because it is very hard on a big game to uh, play test it to balance. Yeah. It, it, it's a lot of work. Lot but, of, yeah, you know, I'm like, sorry. Like, uh, maybe just today you were finding out rules changes. That yeah, just some, these lawyers are great because they'll say, you know, that is entirely clear. And so you go back and you word it a little better because yeah. it's all about filling out the wording. Yep. You know, it, it is a definite lesson in lawyerness. Yeah. And it's also the balance. You know, a lot of gamers... They're so romanced by the history or whatever they're trying to portray, whether it's fantasy or history, right. that they get so caught up in, you know, well, this half track is so cool and I got to get it in here, that they don't really focus on the math and balance. Right. And I'm more into that so than. I'm going to have to. Oh, yeah, it's I his turn. It's a tournament the, uh, and it's his turn. <laughs> so he has to go. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's real. <coughs> yeah. Um, so um, that was an advantage, is just to, you know, I think you got to let it go. And the only thing you have to deal with when you deal with that is. The historical types coming up and going, you know, that border on Prussia really isn't very valid, you know, and you kind of have to go, yes, I know, you know, the game plays better if I move the line, so, you know, right. sorry, <laughs> but, you know, but that's important, so. Okay, so. Back to Deb. Uh, back to me. So, I have heard that there is a variant to your game. Usually the game starts in 1942, oh, yeah. and you are working on a variant if you want to start it in 1939. Yeah. I happen a, to know. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, there are, there are several. Uh, yeah, we started out with the basic 42, uh, but I, uh, I actually had a little bit of forethought. I, I designed the original board to be colored like 39 
so that we can start at 39 as well. And uh, yeah, so there's a 39 version. And there's also, you can add on things like, um, we call the Manufacturing and Recruiting Handbook. Uh, because a lot of gamers have all their pewter pieces for you know PT boats and big battleships and what have you. So we created a generic um, you know mathematical calculations for that. So you can introduce any piece you want from a partisan to a biplane to a heavy bomber to a, to a rail gun. If you've got the, the piece for it, this, this book will generate the math. Uh, and then we also have, um, as part of the 39 and the 42, the Diplomat's Guide to World Domination, which is, uh, has all the, uh, did all the history on the, uh, on the neutral countries from you know, to Bolivia to you know, Estonia or whatever. And so it's a module that at the top of the game turn, you do what we call political unrest and influence. And so that way you can actually involve neutral countries instead of just, you know, just making them a generic number to hit. And there's assassinations and coups, and they're all based on historical situations. And then they just have probabilities so that, you know, this guy may, this election may not happen, that coup may not happen. And then there's the names. And so and it's been fun because we like had a guy yesterday from Bolivia and these two guys are Bolivia, and I said, oh, you got to see this. And I show them the Bolivia page, and they go, oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that happened. And that's, that's like the probability. And yes, he did take over. And so it was, very, it was a nice verification, too. And it also apparently means that Wikipedia is fairly accurate, <laughs> um, so, which is always in question. Um, yes. Right? And uh, no, I, I did this before Wikipedia. But anyway, uh, yeah. And so there's that. Um, we have defenses and fortifications. So if you want to add in landmines and sea mines and sub pens and all that sort of yeah. stuff. Uh, we have um, the naval engagement, which I'm finishing up. Which has uh, we had an earlier draft, but I'm trying to I had to fix it. Which is layers of uh, radar and sonar and radio detection. And so in that version, in the beginning of 39, you know the the subs are running rampant because you have no sonar, you can't see them, uh, and then also ships can be you know barely off your coast and you don't know they're there. Uh, and then as you acquire more technology. Uh, you'd be able to detect them and you can put outpost units out in the Aleutian Island or something like that so you can find them. Uh, and again, try to balance the math and stuff so it wasn't some sort of daunting thing. I try to keep it very, very simple. Simplicity, for those who are making games, simplicity. Don't, you know, because people put so many layers of rules to, again, create historical romance that they forget. You, sometimes you just got to round it off and say, and take the complaints uh, just so that you can, you know, uh, have it playable in less than 30 hours, you know. Yeah, we're uh, yeah. yeah. And this game usually on a the basic 1942 basic, yeah. like that's basic. But the basic 42 is a you know four or six hour game for experienced players, and then you can do the 39 with all the bells and whistles down to fortifications and spend 12 hours if you really want to. But uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. So and you know you get the, the people keep demanding more. You know that's the only thing, and I do the best I can. But I have a I have the rest of my life, so I have to uh, also. I wish I could I wish I could make money doing nothing but this game, but uh, it doesn't quite work. Um, and, uh, and we're almost out, too. So, yeah, we, we had 2,000 copies. It was the original run uh, three years ago, and we're down to about 25 copies. Oh, wow. Um, so we're going to do another print run, but it'll probably be two or three years. Um, and mainly because uh, those who don't know about game production, you know, you, you, when you make it, you have to do a minimum, yeah, you have to do a minimum run, two or 3,000, first of all. And then second of all, you have to store those if you don't sell those. And this is a big, heavy game. And so if you've got 3,000 copies... Uh, and you only sell the first 300, you're gonna you know, spend a fortune. And I'm from California, where real estate's expensive. We don't, you know, we, uh, yeah. a warehouse space is uh, as a premium. Right. So, uh, so we kind of have to wait a little bit. Plus, he's gonna tool out the rest of the pieces. Uh, with the one cost-saving measure, you know, when Larry from Pegasus first made this, he was afraid that a hundred-dollar game would be daunting. Now, hundred-dollar games are common, uh, but at that time, it was like a hundred-dollar game. Oh, you know. So we've got to keep this cost set. So what he did is we only made German pieces and then just made them different colors. That was one of the cost-saving measures. But now we will tool out. And then people steal them. I mean, these guys have got a pewter set, you know, of a, you know, elegant. And there's a lot of that. You see that around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> B-roll, B-roll. And, um, yeah. And, uh, but, yeah, so we're going to flesh out the rest of the pieces, all the different countries. And then, uh, and, and again, Larry from Pegasus was a little hesitant. But I just went to him and I said, You've seen the fans, right? And he goes, yeah, yeah, people love the game and the math is balanced, right? If we tool out these pieces, this will be the undisputed best World War II game ever. And so, and he's like, yeah, you know, it's like total Rudy pep talk, you know, and I had this guy, come on, we're going to win, we're going to win. And so, and he's like, okay. And he went back to China and now he's starting to tool the pieces. So uh, it's awesome. like, yay. So, but there you go. Well, we had another one of our podcasters and now he's disappeared. So I don't know where he went. 
So. Oh, he asks stupid questions anyway. Oh, okay. Who he is. All right. Well, Tony, I'm going to hand it to you for one final question, and then we are going to let Jeff get back to running his tournament. Final question is, where's the restroom? Yes, uh, that's so true. Uh, that way. Yes, and, it is. Um, the massage table is over there. Okay, so in your... Oh, yes. I want to... Actually, I think that's where I'm headed here, not yeah, too exactly. long. So where, if folks are out there and they want to get their hands on one of these last 15 or 20 before two to three years of no war game yeah, yeah. around... Where would they go? Can they go on the internet, or yeah, how do they get a hold of that? Thewargame.com. Thewargame.com. Pretty simple. Uh, then you'll, uh, but if, yeah, buy the game, and then you'll have to email me because I have to. I literally go to the warehouse and see if there's still some left. And then um, the other thing I was going to say, uh, part of the reason why I was called the War Game World War II is because I'm also uh, working in the entertainment industry, and I wrote a screenplay and a stage play called The War Game. A lot of people don't know that. It, you'll see if they go to the website. And uh, we put it up as a show, a very successful run in Los Angeles. Uh, and the, uh, the premise of it is, uh, I'll give you the log line as we say in Hollywood, five weekend gamers discover that the World War II strategy game they're playing is rewriting history as they play, forcing these armchair generals to make life and death decisions that will change themselves and the world forever. And, um, and so it's this kind of a long form Twilight Zone uh, stage play slash movie where they're playing and then you know stuff starts happening it's like wow why is there only three channels on television now that the uh, the japanese have conquered the west coast and you know because the uh, bad guys start to win so they get they find themselves in a fascist world and they have to play the game out but then of course of course to make it dramatic the german player says no i'm gonna win this is an opportunity to go to get order in the world you know and so it becomes where instead of a bunch of guys going we got to fix history you have an actual conflict uh and then you of course it's a happy ending you know everybody fixes history and and that sort of thing but we'll uh you know i may still we may still do that as a film someday we had uh, financing off and on and you know the usual story of uh of uh, development in, uh, in movies, but we'll get to it. We'll get to it eventually. Or at least put the play up again somewhere, which is really fun, which I acted in. You may tell I've got a little bit of a personality at times. I like to be in front of things and people and, you know, my shy I'm still working on my shyness. I'm trying to, trying to develop it, trying to develop my shyness. I was really worried about it last year when I first met him. Yeah. He was so humble and quiet. I really wanted to get him to open up a little bit. Especially humble. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, <sighs> All right. Well, I'm going to let you go back to running your thank war. You. Thank you. And thank you so much for working thank on this you. game. It is so much fun. I'm doing this. I'm so glad. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Right. thank you. Enjoy the rest of Gen Con. Okay. Thanks. Bye.